Hello to everyone who is tuned in, and thank you for joining us. Um, I am Meredith Reed, and I'm going to be your host for this episode of The Brief. So January is National Human Trafficking and Prevention Month, and in this episode, we are discussing how predators use online communities to find and traffic kids. And so I'm here with Justin Davis, co-founder and CEO at Spectrum Labs. And our special guest for this episode is Jo Lembo. She's the Nat National Outreach Manager at Shared Hope International. And Shared Hope International is an organization that is working to put an end to sex trafficking. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And Joe, if you could just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and a little bit more about what Shared Hope International is working on. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Spectrum. I am really pleased to be here today representing Shared Hope International. As Meredith said, my name is Joe Lembo. And 10 years ago, I really had no idea that US children were being sold for commercial sex acts in our own backyards. I had read Linda Smith's first book, Renting Lacey, and I began to understand how it happens, what makes kids vulnerable, what are the tactics that pimps use, and how we can effectively fight it. So today I'm the National Outreach Manager, working with trained ambassadors, volunteers across the nation to educate their communities to help us all protect kids from predators. And could you tell us a little bit more about your organization's founding story? Yes, um, in 1998, uh, then US Congresswoman Linda Smith uh, visited Mumbai. She received a call from a pastor friend who said children are being sold on Falkland Road in chicken wire cages. And you have no idea the magnitude of the sex slavery going on in India. She thought it surely can't be that bad. And so she booked her own flight and went to Mumbai, arriving at about one in the morning. She said, take me to the brothels. They said, do you want to go now? And she said, I'm assuming they're operating now, so take me now. So as she walked down the alleyways and she saw literally chicken wire cages with small metal beds and children that looked to her uh, the same age as her granddaughter, about 10 years old, um, her heart really broke. And she uh, saw one little girl come out of the, the little doorway and stood right there. And being a, a woman of faith, she said she felt like that moment God said to her, reach out and touch her for me. And she said, this child smelled like a, a thousand men, had no idea what manner of disease she might have. But she said, I reached out my arms and she fell against my chest and I could feel her heartbeat. And she said, at that time, I knew I had to do something. And so that was the first village of hope that was born. Uh, several more followed. And when she left Congress, she started Shared Hope International. And today the villages still thrive. We support seven international partners and we provide grant money for five USA restoration organizations. But in 2006, um, our board of directors recognized that this was an issue that was here in the United States, that our own children were at risk and being sold and so they pulled our focus back to the United States and began to fiercely protect minors on our own soil. Um, we do that through our three pillars, prevention, which is where I live in the prevention pillar, uh, which is, I say, the happy place because I'm actually preventing it from happening and helping to educate communities. Uh, we teach youth, parents, teachers, anyone who works with kids, um, how to recognize the signs and how to effectively respond to that. We also have restoration, which supports our partners, which I mentioned earlier, um, providing direct services both internationally and here in the US. And then there's the uh, bringing justice part and through training law enforcement, judges, prosecutors, and passing laws that will strengthen sentencing for all of the perpetrators in the commercial sex market uh, that are seeking to have sex or sell children for sex in the US. We include all predators, all facilitators, everyone involved in that chain of marketing that would seek to buy children and sell them. So that's what I do and that's who Shared Hope is. 
Thank you for sharing that. And that's such an incredibly powerful founding story and something that I think many people aren't even aware is happening and that it's not only a problem overseas, but also here in the U.S., which we'll get into a little bit more in a bit. Yes. Um, speaking of that advocacy piece that you touched on, um, Shared Hope International recently started an institute for justice and advocacy. Is that what it's called? It um, could you share a little bit more about that? Super exciting. I was there and it is powerful to be just two blocks from the White House. Uh, the Institute is a venue and it's a voice for survivors of sex trafficking. It represents justice and advocacy. It's a center for training, for research, for education, and it gathers and concentrates the power of Shared Hope's collective resources under one roof. Now, the word justice is vital in the Institute's name because we're fighting for justice on behalf of the victims of child sex trafficking in America. That institute houses some of the nation's finest attorneys on this topic, and they work out of that office working with all lawmakers, legislators in all the states and DC. And advocates and stakeholders come from across the spectrum of sex trafficking prevention, and they'll convene at the institute to uh, work on justice and restorative initiatives. Uh, they'll participate in training programs uh, we train law enforcement, social workers, lawyers, first responders, doctors, legislators, judges, all of those who are in a position to make changes and advocate for the rights of victims. Those are the ones that we want to convene there and gather together. Um, the, the Institute's seven special efforts are listed on our website at sharedhope.org. And that's what will enable Shared Hope to dig deeper with a more extant, expanded and aggressive stance uh, it means taking on the emerging, emerging challenges as they come. So as things face Shared Hope, we're in a position with this location to convene those who can make a difference. And I think that advocacy piece and the education piece is so important in government. And I think it's incredible um, that Shared Hope International is doing, playing such a large role in um, being an advocate for policies and for laws to be in place that are protecting sex trafficking victims and, and especially for children. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the government, the US Department of Defense uh, has named human trafficking as the world's fastest growing crime. So could you tell us a little bit more about what exactly is behind that? Well, greed in one word, um, money, which goes hand in hand with greed, that's really what's behind all of it. Um, if there was no demand, there would be no market. And there are those that can sell uh, people in order to make a profit. And so that's really the bottom line that drives the market. Now, human trafficking is a very broad topic that also includes labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking. So. Uh, Human trafficking happens in every nation on the earth. Uh, it's global, it's all ages, all nationalities. Um, it is everywhere on the earth. And so that's a little staggering. Uh, a full explanation of human trafficking is outlined in the TIP report, TIP, Trafficking in Persons, and that's issued by the US State Department's office each year. And it ranks governments on their perceived efforts to acknowledge and combat uh, human trafficking. So that's kind of a broad picture of human trafficking. Now, Shared Hope was the first non-governmental organization to recognize and to name the horrific phenomenon of commercial sexual exploitation of minors uh, here in the U.S. And so we named it Domestic Minor Sex Trafficking. And DMST focuses on the commercial sex market for minors in the U.S. and how to end the demand that sells children like products. Yeah, and Meredith, I would add to that, say another reason that I think the proliferation of human trafficking has increased over the last several years is really about access. The internet <clears throat> makes it really easy to uh, exploit and groom and find victims of all different ages and types, uh, whether you're talking about gaming platforms or social networks or dating apps. And so it's just a lot easier now to um, 
find these folks and, and, and put these, put them through these types of behaviors. So true. Absolutely. Um, and taking it back to you, Joe, um, because our listeners work mostly for U.S. based companies, uh, could you give, give us a better idea of what does human trafficking look like in the U.S. and how does it compare to the rest of the world? Well, yesterday, a study came out from the Minnesota Department of Health and the University of Minnesota School of Nursing that was really staggering. So I'm going to read a few statistics for you because it really is what sex trafficking looks like in the U.S. So for the first time ever, ninth and 11th graders in Minnesota schools were asked, have you ever traded sex or sexual activity to receive money, food, drugs, alcohol, or anything of value? And the results from that single question out of um, thousands and thousands and thousands of children was about one in five students answered in the affirmative. 5,000 students said, yes, they had, had, uh, had traded sex or sexual activity for something of value. Of those 5,000, wow. it's evident that trans, non-gender conforming, Native, American, uh, African American, and Latina youth are disproportionately impacted. We knew that, but to see it in stats that came right from the children's mouths was um, sobering. Surprisingly, the highest rates were reported in rural parts of the state of Minnesota. That was surprising because most often we think it happens in cities, off of major freeways, it happens in huge conference centers, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what makes kids in rural parts of America even more vulnerable. Supporting what we already knew, that youth with the following histories were disproportionately um, at risk, we found that it was far more likely if the child also answered yes to Department of Juvenile Justice involvement, foster care involvement, sexual violence against them or in their home, unstable housing, or if they had spent time in alternative learning centers. Now, this is just one study in one state with thousands of kids answering, but the results are staggering and most likely understated as the survey was only two classes, uh, ninth and 11th graders, and it doesn't account for those who may have been missing that day, which is more likely to be the at-risk kids. So chances are uh, with truancy and uh, running away and kids who are missing from school, those are the ones that are in the highest um, risk group. Um, in the US, minor victims of commercial sexual exploitation are predominantly recruited and groomed by predators online, as was stated earlier, and who are seeking fraudulent relationships. They'll learn the kids' needs, their hopes, their dreams, their hurts, and then they'll use that information against them. Shared Hope recently did a, a six-month research project where um, our researchers posed as various aged uh, females online, creating um, fresh profiles. And the purpose originally was to find out how kids are using apps and what their experience is. And we knew there would be um, negative feedback, things that we knew were out there, but we wanted to hear it right from the kids. So we didn't wanna just do our own studies and then assume what kids were thinking. And so we posed as a petite 15 year old girl and we began to reach out to general audiences uh, to ask, uh, what's this app for? It's very popular. Are you on it? What do you do with this app? And uh, we found out far more than we were expecting. Responses were almost immediate and multiple from older males trying to engage with our 15-year-old persona. One male seemed to prefer younger children with the profile icon of a puppy, and his screen name was an emoji of a tiger. And he um, later asked our research profile to send him a photo of her in her jammies, reflecting language that a younger children ch child might use. That in itself was alarming. Another predator used questions to try to relate to our researcher child, making it very easy then to fabricate ways in which they could be similar and understand and build trust. For instance, he waited until the researcher said she played soccer before he shared that he also played soccer. 
Now, in many parts of the world, you asked about trafficking at large. Um, the cultural bias against women creates the market and often places it in the open, right out where you can see it. Um, many countries still consider a woman or a wife as property. Uh, many countries subdue the rights of women. And so in those countries, we'll see um, sex trafficking in particular uh, very much out in the open and very much culturally accepted. Now here in the US, it's hidden behind the screen of a mobile device or a computer. Um, pimps seldom have to risk uh, on the street negotiations or being in the hallway of a hotel or the parking lot of a business, but instead they can find, recruit, and sell their product of children from the safety of their own home. Thinly veiled sites that promote um, confidential converse conversations and meetups uh, such as the Whisper app was one that we um, did some extensive research in. It has a hot teen girls byline uh, or, or sites uh, page, sorry, with a byline that says teen girls just looking to talk to sexy guys. And we find often on a number of the sites, the restriction, age restriction is 12, uh, which is not easily enforced. Any kid can say they're older than, you know, whatever it's asking them to say. Um, but I, I'm alarmed because so many of these sites will also um, snag 18 year olds. Uh, we're finding as the laws uh, come down more on the trafficking of minors, that pimps are moving to college campuses and recruiting the college students that look like they're 14. And so even some of these sites that are restricted to 18 years or older are still dangerous, even though these kids are considered uh, mature enough to have left home. Um, hey Joe, there was a, a question from the audience real quickly. Yeah. Um, which app did, did, you, did Shared Hope use to pose as a 15 year old girl? We used a number of apps. The most common one, which has now been shut down, was Kick. And as you know, if you've researched those apps, um, Kick was in news, news articles and headlines a lot for being used to bring kids um, in, uh, trapping them and, and using them for various things. Um, there were even murders involved. And so Kick was one that they used. They also used, as I said, Whisper. And then if you go to our website, sharedhope.org slash internet safety slash, there is a whole page of apps that we researched. And we wanted to look at the good things that these apps do because they are amazing. And the internet is an incredible tool to connect people and open Absolutely. our horizons. Um, but the list of apps is there. I think there were 14 of them that were utilized in this research. So, Thank you, Joe, for all of that information. It's truly staggering and also really obviously upsetting to hear. I think we know that some of this goes on, but when you really look at the data, there's such a prevalence of predators on any sort of social site um, and girls and women are disproportionately affected. Um, so it's it's definitely good to have that awareness of what is actually happening on these platforms. And Joe, so, made, a, and Joe made a good point about it too. Like, it's just like our, our offline safe spaces. There are lots of great things out in the community and the real world that are very positive where people can go and enjoy themselves and find entertainment and, and build community. Uh, and those places also have, you know, challenges around, you know, trust and safety or public safety. And so the internet's no different in that. Um, but there, you know, for all the, the bad stuff we see, I mean, there's a ton of uh, positive experiences that folks get to have on the internet. Yes. Well. I don't want to get that, I want right. to that lost in the, in the discussion. Absolutely. And I'm old enough to remember when there wasn't an internet. And so this is a huge, wonderful world out there. I mean, it connects me to my children and grandchildren across the nation, which, yay. So, yeah, yeah I agree. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, I guess my next question for you is. I'm sure a lot of people want, like you were saying, the internet has so many good features to it. We all want to keep using the internet, um, but we want to do so in a safe way. So um, my question is, what can we do as consumers and as people on these platforms to make sure that either ourselves or our children are taking safety measures that can protect them, um, be the first line of defense um, against 
predatory behavior? That's a great question and one that I, I get all the time from my parents, teachers, pastors, youth leaders, any caring adult, that's the question they ask. Um, traffickers use personal information to develop trust and a bond between themselves and who they hope to be their victim. And so eventually they'll ask them to meet and, and that's when the child is trapped and they disappear. So one of the first lines of defense is to teach young people all the way down to the very first time they have a, an iPhone in their hand is that they have to be careful about the information they share, their school schedule, who their best friend is, when they feel like running away from home. All these personal things that kids tend to share without thought um, are being picked up by predators and then utilized. We heard one story of a girl. Um, she was mad at her mom. She'd gotten a bad grade. She'd gotten grounded. Uh, mom had gone to work and she had not yet left for school. And she posted on her social media that she was so mad at her mom, she just wanted to run away. When she left the, the house about 20 minutes later to walk to school, there was a woman in a car sitting at the curb, rolled the window down and said, would you like a ride? And she said, no, I'm not supposed to ride with strangers. And she goes, well, I know you're really upset with your mom. And I know that you really would, you know, you're thinking about running away and, and, you know, I'm just here to listen. I'm just your friend. And the girl got in the car and then uh, disappeared. So those are the kind of things that kids need to be so aware of is don't tell everything about who you are, where you are, don't post your class schedule, that kind of thing. But the important thing for the adults in their lives is to set the privacy settings so that uh, even photos don't have locators um, with them. They need to go through. Um, we did an exhaustive study as well on preventative messages, uh, uh, preventative equipment, things that you can utilize, tools. And that's also at sharedhope.org slash internet safety. Um, they are ever-changing, so we are ever-changing the website, finding new tools and finding new ways. But that, I think, is the most important thing is for those who care about kids to teach them not to share their whole life on the Internet and then for their caregivers to be sure that their, their settings are so that it's not so easy for predators to find them. Now, so let's actually, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I just, let's take this one step further. So, and Justin looping you into this. So yes, the kids can do certain things to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the parent's responsibility to make sure certain safety measures are in place. Mm -hmm. But it's also the responsibility of these platforms to have an infrastructure in place that is going to protect the users. So um, Justin, you work with a variety of different companies, gaming, social media, um, even peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and their trust and safety teams all have to address these threats. So my question for you is, what are the best trust and safety teams out there doing to address human trafficking and similar disruptive behaviors? Yeah, and, and before I answer that, um, to address the previous question as well, I think research shows that about 18% of people report other users. So I think there's a lot of education that that needs to happen around teaching people how to use these reporting features um, of all ages across all platforms. And for some platforms, it's more challenging. They weren't built with safety by design in mind. And so it's really difficult to even understand where these reporting features are in the platform, or even more importantly, um, how to monitor the case once you've reported it. A lot of people feel pretty frustrated, I think, by the fact that they, there's no case management or any effective way of really tracking once you've reported another user what happens? It could take hours or days or months, and by that time, uh, the, the damage is, has been done. On the other side of that, there has been a lot of work by many different nonprofits and NGOs out there that are trying to educate everyone from parents to teachers to kids. Folks at I Can Help do a lot of great work there. Uh, there's international folks like the Internet Watch Foundation. Uh, the ADL does a lot of work in that area. Social Media Matters. Um, so there's just there's a lot of great folks that are very passionate about exactly what you're what you were asking about around training um, people around how to use social media responsibly and how to report things when they see something uh, we, we see this in the real world and back in the day it used to be you know don't talk to strangers right and so this is just an evolution of that uh, in certain metropolitan areas you have or in, you know new york specifically you have the whole um if you see something say something and i think right now 
folks for the, uh, for the most part, at least 80% or so don't necessarily say something. They either a trip from the platform or a trip from the conversation or disengage completely. And that doesn't really help the social media platform uh, of any type, dating app, gaming company, marketplace, whatever it is, it doesn't help them identify it. Um, but they, they need to know when uh, a user is feeling harassed, that's a helpful signal for them that feeds into a lot of the data that they're looking at, their moderation systems. And so it, it really relies on the community to not self-moderate or self-police, but it's, a, uh, it's an important function that has to be much more robust and easier for consumers and users to use so that they can feed stuff into social media platforms so they can effectively moderate and protect their community and protect their brand and, and so forth on the question you just asked. Yeah. I mean, this is in terms of teams and structures and how to, how do these companies think about different um, building a, an organization that's staffed appropriately to address these issues. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a meaty one, right? Like you've got uh, historically, you've got teams that uh, trust and safety teams that were embedded into marketing or in engineering or in product. Uh, and those were disenfranchised and disconnected from the policy folks and from the legal teams. And those were even further disconnected from maybe uh, the CMO. Um, and, and then even further, you have data science teams that aren't really embedded into those groups either. Uh, those groups either. Over the last couple of years, I think you've seen some advancements there. There's been some, some really nice consolidation that we've witnessed and experienced uh, with our customers and partners where we've seen the, the best teams structured are ones that have a pretty solid alignment across folks in policy and marketing, trust and safety, data science, uh, and, and maybe even corporate social and responsibility for, for things uh, for folks that are looking at uh, and paying attention to things like digital wellness and the mental health of the moderators uh, and the folks that are having to re, um, you know, weed through this content on a daily basis. That's increasingly becoming a, an important factor in the way that these teams are structured and they're monitored and they're measured, uh, as well as um, how we take care of these folks that are having to uh, deal with this stuff on a daily basis. Um, so I don't think there's a right, uh, there's not necessarily a, a silver bullet or a panacea for any given organization because some of these social platforms, they're run really lean. Like some of the largest dating apps in the world, for example, have 30, 40, 50 people total. And then you have some of the larger you know, conglomerates, they have you know, 500 people on staff and 55% of their workforce is moderation, is uh, content safety and user safety folks. Um, so there, there really isn't a right way. It just depends on honestly how the, the app or the, or the platform is structured. Do they have a robust um, set of safety features built in, you know, safety by design? And have they done a good job of educating their users and their consumers on how to flag and report abuse or toxic behaviors? Um, when it comes to tr uh, human trafficking, that's, it's a little bit more nuanced. There's a lot more things that have to be in place for detecting something that's as esoteric as uh, and nuanced as, as human trafficking. The same with things like sexual harassment is not necessarily as cut and dry depending upon the context, you know, two consenting adults versus two kids. Um, and there's certain sequences of emojis, for example, that on certain platforms are completely benign. Um, but if they're used in um, other areas like marketplaces, um, like a, a crown and an airplane and a bag of money, for example, that sequence of emoji could indicate that there's something more nefarious going on. And so again, context matters, but you have to have the right people on staff that understand this stuff all the way from the, the folks setting the policies and community guidelines to the folks that actually go and have to look and re review this content. Uh, and the last point on this, the, the thing that's probably not the most important, but is uh, increasingly becoming more and more important as, as folks are more aware of what these issues represent is having a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion on those teams. Um, you've got to have all sorts of different backgrounds and creeds and ethnicities and religions and genders represented um, because that's the only way to appropriately you know, address or cater to the needs of you know, at least the 80% of the population and knowing that you're never, probably never going to get it 100% right, but making sure that there's a strong commitment to D, DEI or DNI on the team um, makes a big difference. And the ones that we've seen do it really, really well. Absolutely. Um, and that's all really good information. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe take it a step further and give an example of one platform in particular and some of the processes that they have in place 
that are have proven to be more effective against uh, fighting against human trafficking? Hmm. I think I'm not sure I would call out one platform in particular. I mean, they every platform struggles to identify this particular behavior. I think what a lot of teams are doing from a process standpoint is they are clearly defining that this behavior is not allowed. Um, I, I think, you know, someone like, um, like Roblox, uh, Laura Higgins, if you ever see any of her tweets, I think she does a phenomenal job of kind of leading the charge over there around um, understanding what it is to, to build a civil um, environment on their platform and educating you know, kids and parents around how to have certain types of conversations, how to understand when, when bad things are happening. Um, but it's difficult for something like human trafficking. It, it, it comes down to education. Um, and it's just, it's really hard to engage with um, your consumers and, and, and help them understand exactly when that stuff's happening. So I wouldn't say that anyone's really solved this behavior explicitly. Um, but there are, you know, many, almost every platform has some team in place that is looking at um, these types of things and under and trying to understand when really nefarious things are happening, like human trafficking. I think what, what goes into it first is setting up a clear set of guidelines and principles that says these behaviors are allowed um, and not allowed. Something that's cut and dry is, is human trafficking, obviously, is, is something that I think some platforms don't even have to <laughs> explicitly say in their guidelines because that's uh, illegal, but uh, I think at a high level, just making sure that your users understand what the expectation is that they have of being on the platform and what kind of conversations or content that they should expect is an important part of it, um, because it, then it helps the users understand when something is kind of out of bounds or not. And this doesn't seem normal in the in the normal co course of the conversation that should be happening on that platform. And where are we at with the automation of flagging these type of behaviors? Uh, obviously, this is your wheelhouse, Justin. So can you talk a little bit more to the technology that is being developed to counteract uh, disruptive behaviors on these type of platforms? Yeah, I mean, I've spent uh, almost two decades now in data. I think it comes down it, for any sort of automation to happen um, across any, any vertical or industry, much less trust and safety. It really comes down to the amount of data and labeled data that you have in order to build a detection algorithm that can understand not just general toxicity or severe toxicity, but under, have specific labeled data that can detect that exact behavior on your platform. Uh, in terms of fully automating uh, that, that, I mean, we may never get to a, a place where the entire ecosystem is completely automated by machines. And I'm not, sh I'm not sure that we necessarily want to. I think you're always going to want to have some level of human judgment uh, and moderation and data labeling and oversight in there to make sure that uh, the systems are, are, are moving along in the right place. But I would say that historically, a lot of, you know, over the last 10 years, we've seen a pretty strong evolution of historical platforms that were really relying on users to re you know, flag other users. And again, that's a small percentage, or they were, you know, building out simple keyword detection systems using things like lists of words or terms or regex. Uh, to identify, hey, this this word is typically associated with bullying or human trafficking. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that it floods the moderation systems with all sorts of false positives and signals that aren't really helpful. Um, that doesn't help them do their job. And on average, I think it costs the moderation team anywhere from a dollar to six dollars to to review and uh, make a determination on a specific case. And so this can get very expensive if you're dealing with a lot of cases that aren't actually what the system flagged uh, is what they are. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of um, uh, data science teams at different platforms and external vendors, partners, competitors, whatever it might be, um, build out uh, classifiers or, or, or simple classifiers that look at a snapshot in time. So they'll look at a single message or you know, four or five sentences and they're typically constrained by a limited amount of text. If you're just talking about text uh, in the conversation that they can review. And, but that's phenomenally more accurate than keyword detection, which is great. And that's exactly where things should go. I think the next evolution that you'll see uh, over the next probably two years is um, a much more robust context sensing type of classification system that understands the nuance of, hey, this is a sexual conversation, but is it to consenting adults or is it to children? Um, being platform aware, uh, understanding things like you know, time spent on platform or age or gender, things that 
um, that help provide a, a better understanding of what is this conversation about? Is it, and it, is it a conversation that's happened over many, many months where there's a, um, a, a propensity that, that can uh, be built around saying, hey, we think this, the system can say, hey, we think this thing is starting to look a lot like grooming or human trafficking because of the, the velocity or uh, the nature of the conversation and maybe how that particular person or node communicates with other nodes uh, on that platform. Uh, those are all healthy signals, but again, that doesn't get you to a, a complete state of automation. It just gets you to a much more efficient way of detecting things. How you ultimately moderate and decide to automate is a whole separate conversation, and that has to be tied effectively to your policies, um, the the staff. You know, if you don't have a ton of people that are, are resources that you can throw, you know, not everyone's got fifteen thousand people that they can throw at this problem uh, or can afford to throw at this problem. So. I think some of the, the behaviors can be automated against, like it's very clear if you don't want certain terms or certain clear cut phrases that may indicate it's cyberbullying or things like that. But when it comes to the human trafficking, that's, a, that's just such a nuance and specific set of content that has to happen to indicate that maybe even something is starting to go in that direction that I don't know that that one can be automated, but what can happen is an, a, a major improvement into the way that that type of conversation, not just message or sentence or word, but the way that that conversation or thread or community or, or chat uh, is starting to, to look like it may, um, may constitute an element of human trafficking. And that, that stuff is where I think the, the big part of the improvements will come over the next couple of years. I would also think that there's going to be a massive leap in technology with identifying the person behind the screen. Now, at this point in time, it's relatively easy to come up to create a fake identity, a fake profile, and continue to create fake profiles. And there's a lot of danger, I would think, in yes. human trafficking with having that phenomenon going on. I was just at State of the Net uh, yesterday, and um, that was one of the, the – a big topic that came up was around um, – just account verification and, and identity and understanding who people are online. But if we go down that rabbit hole, which I think is a great solution that we don't do that personally at Spectrum um, as a previous company, but uh, there are lots of vendors out there that do. And I think that's great. And it's absolutely where the industry should go in terms of having some level of identifier or way of verifying that the user is a real person. The problem is, and this maybe is a topic for another <laughs> um, podcast, but how, where do you draw the line? How far down the rabbit hole does that go in terms of you having a single identifier across every different platform? Um, you know, who stores that information, who holds it, who sees that global identity is a very tricky conversation to navigate. And whoever does own that space has a ton of power. And uh, we're just we're just not ready for that. But yes, you are correct that there does need to be some level of account verification and validation that needs to happen uh, for these platforms. And that definitely gives the folks who do do some of that have a much better path of uh, enforcing moderation or putting the liability on the user, which is what CDA 230 is all about, is making sure that it's not necessarily about indemnifying the platform. It's about making sure that the the responsibility or the onus of that nefarious behavior is where it should be, which is on the individual. And account verification is a great step in trying to make sure that that happens. Yeah, absolutely. And clearly there's so much here. There's so much to talk about. Uh, I think we could probably use two more hours on this topic. Sure. Unfortunately, we are getting short on time. And Joe, I wanna make sure that I bounce the conversation back to you before we go. So um, just to wrap this up, uh, would you like to give us a few uh, key takeaways from everything you spoke about today? And also, could you let our listeners know how they can support Shared Hope International? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, one thing Justin said that was very striking um, was the the peer to peer marketing or P to P uh, sorry P to P uh, marketing uh, platforms. The other thing is on social media sites. When we interviewed kids through our research over and over and over again on all different apps, we asked, "What do you use this app for?" And astoundingly, the answer came back multiple times: talking to strangers and sending nudes. 
So teens are playing around with sexting and while they're doing that, predators are watching and planning how to ensnare them. So that's something we really want to educate. Works close to the Center for Exploited Children and they and tell caregivers with minors is if something alarming comes up on the computer or on the phone, not to delete it, not to erase it, but to contact your local law enforcement and they begin that uh, process of of searching and finding out who that person really is and what their intentions were. So National Center for Missed and Exploited Children, 1-800-THE-LOST, they're an incredible partner and we appreciate their work nationwide. But to become involved and to support Shared Hope, I love that question, thank you, Meredith. Uh, first, become educated. We have tools online. We have a national training conference um, every year. This year, it'll be November 4 to 6 in Washington, D.C. And workshops include online uh, dangers and law enforcement talking about their, their investigations and that sort of thing. So it's a really powerful time where um, advocates and professionals from all across the nation come together and learn how we can keep kids safe in all different places and platforms. Um, the ambassadors are online, they're trained online, they're volunteers, we, ex we provide them a tremendous amount of training and it's all at no cost and I manage the program so I'd love to encourage anybody to come on our website, look for the Ambassadors of Hope. Second, motivate others to learn. Share what you know, share what you've learned. Uh, we just started a new program called Weekend Warriors and how you can make a difference in 15 minutes each weekend. So we just give you multiple tools and links and films that you can forward to your networks, which is a great easy way. And to get involved, um, raising funds, obviously we always need funds to do what we do. That's how we offer many of our tools at, at no charge to our audiences. And then support your legislators in passing stronger laws, do what you can to protect children and hold predators um, accountable. And if somebody wants to get their hands dirty locally, I want to do something, uh, find a local transition home that, that serves this very vulnerable population and ask them what they need and how you can help. So that's my suggestions. I have lots more. You're right. We could do this for several hours. But thank you so much for inviting Shared Hope International to your forum today. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful information you brought to us today. Um, so I think that's going to do it for this episode of The Brief. Thank you so much to Joe Lembo and thank you to Justin Davis uh, for being here today and tune in next time uh, for another episode of The Brief. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Cheers.